And how about the screen, Asif? Do you see my screen, what I'm sharing, my dim dim or my R? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I haven't uh, maximized it, so if I if I do it like this, can you see it now better the whole R prompt? Uh, no, maybe I have to do something on my screen. Um, I'll just do it here. Okay. So welcome everyone who of you, those of you who might watch it later from the recorded session, and I just think there's only two of you or one of you today, but that's okay. This is our first session. Maybe more of you will be able to participate later, you know, as, as you need to. I cannot make this session mandatory, but this is my only portal to communicate with you all other than emails, you know, which, which gets very difficult to manage. So welcome. Uh, this is my about, I don't know, fourth semester teaching it. Uh, so I enjoy it. And I work at Merck. I work uh, with clinical data at IT. Uh, and I did my master's at Polytechnic also in bioinformatics. So it's not my day job to process microarray data, but I like programming. I like IT side aspect of it. That's what my strength is. And I enjoyed, you know, doing going through the master's for bioinformatics. Uh, so it's a good opportunity for me to sort of put together what I do as in the IT, uh, where my strengths are, and see and communication and try to develop this module from the industry perspective to see that you know if you start working to analyze this uh, microarray data or any kind of data, you know, how R and different techniques that we have can help you. So that's the brief introduction. Uh, I hope all of you had an opportunity to look at the syllabus uh, that I have posted. Uh, so, and you definitely should, if you haven't by now, get the book Bioconductor Case Studies. Uh, it takes about the first three lectures by the time you sort of get familiarized with the initial topics of what is a microarray, what's normalization, what's some of the t-tests and some of the very rudimentary statistical concepts. But after the third week, you know, you will start very closely following your chapters in your textbook, which is Bioconductor Case Study. And in the homework, you know, the way I will post it, it will tell you that, you know, you have to go to this chapter, look at page this or section, you know, 7.2, whatnot, and you have to use that code. So if you do not have the book, it will be next to impossible uh, to to do the homework. And also I post several vignettes, which is sort of the online help that Bioconductor has or practicals that Bioconductor has based on the homework. So a combination of those two will help you to do your homework. So there'll be seven homeworks, first one being the easiest. Perhaps it sort of gets its gradual difficulty level increases as it goes on, but that's for you to see and tell me how you feel. So there are seven of them, so that's about 50% of your, of your grade, and the other 50% will be the project uh, that you'll be doing. Typically on a class that I have taught in the past, there are about 13 or 14 students, so we had about three groups. So this time, I think we have six or seven of you, so you might want to have two groups. Uh, so that's sort of some of the uh, uh, pre-information I wanted to give you. So get your textbook, and there are also some recommended textbooks. So if you're able to, you know, I highly recommend that uh, you acquire those books. Okay, so Alex can hear, so that's, that's also good. Now, for the lecture one, if you, for the biology background, for, for you, if you want to know, you know, what's gene expression and whatnot, and being a graduate course, I'm pretty sure you guys all know what the biology behind it, it is, but I thought the genebiology.pdf file that I have posted in Blackboard, it's useful, so take a look at there. And what we will do today is we will review a file called um, BWPDF-M1 and another file called Preprocess Affi Data. So the way the Blackboard is organized, you know, you will have your main lecture, then you have some supplement documents. So that supplement documents may tell you, you know, how to get started with R. That's how I did in lecture one. Then maybe there is another supplement document. I forgot. Maybe it's in lecture two. And correct me if I'm wrong. That tells you, you know, what normalization is about. 
and then there will be after we do our web sessions whatever Excel file that I am covering to outline the topic to you or whatever code I may be running or whatever PDF file or PowerPoint slides I may be using I will make a folder called web session one so whatever I am working with in this particular session you will find in that folder so as you are reviewing this lecture later or you have questions you know what I talked about and you can reference to those files and ask me via email you know if you need some clarification so we'll be using couple of these uh, PDF files basically just so you can visualize uh, some of the things and the topics that I'll be discussing and so that will be the first one hour I would like to go very quickly over some of the background of what microarray is at a minimum so you can conceptualize you know the theory behind it and then maybe the later hour I would like to start um, very simple sessions of R and I don't know you know what your programming uh, backgrounds are I'm assuming for some of you it's very good and for some of you maybe you have never programmed on anything but my approach would be assuming that you have never programmed so we'll start to think R as a calculator uh, and doing some calculation and gradually build up some of the capability that it can over time so my assumption is you have very, very minimum exposure to programming but uh, we have to work very hard in next couple of weeks if that's the case uh, so you can actually start writing some lines of codes and do your homeworks that way so uh, it, it will be a little difficult but the only way to accomplish it is to keep trying and uh, and working through those examples that I'll be providing and at any point you know you have question uh, and please feel free to pause me in the um, those of you who are here in the uh, in the telecon or ask me or I am me in the dim dim or later email me you know if something was not clear to you okay so on a high level you know what is that we are here to study so we are here to study the data analysis of mRNA expression ar array right is that's the focus of the course so we study you know how in an experiment the genes between let's say a normal sample tissue or maybe a tissue that is treated with a drug or tissue that may have a disease as such cancer diabetes and whatnot so what's the difference between the gene expression and what are the genes that have similar expression you know between those different sample types so that's what our main focus of the study we will get data primarily from Affymetrix platform and I will tell you briefly what's Affymetrix about and what's a two color array and everything that we will be doing in our seven homeworks and data analysis will be strictly using R and Bioconductor and that's the main focus of the course to build your capability in R and Bioconductor we will not be using any other tools or any other uh, programming language you know you can do most of this analysis from a lot of, of, lot of tools uh, that are available uh, both freewares uh, public or commercially uh, but the goal of this course is for you to do it uh, through programming and through bioconductor and that's where you'll be building your pipelines so the course as I said mostly follows your textbook other than at the beginning the first three lectures and at the end you know when we will do a meta-analysis which is a complex topic which is putting up, up putting uh, together data from many different experiments and coming to a single conclusion that's not in your uh, uh, book so we will study that and linear modeling which is you know if you have an experiment that's done let's say one hour 10 hour and 24 hour at three different time points so how do you analyze experiments that are across time points how do you analyze experiments that's across different uh, uh, you know platforms or different multiple experiments so those two topics of linear linear modeling and meta-analysis uh, is not on your textbooks at the, at the last lecture I think probably lecture 12 or lecture 11 uh, we will do it through uh, different materials what we <clears throat> do not cover so as you see microarray on its own is a huge topic and a broad technology and there's a lot of applications of this you can have a DNA protein interaction type microarray which is chip chip you have a lot of next generation sequencing that are going on now for copy number variation and genotyping <clears throat> so all those are not in scope of our particular course because as you will see just understanding the sequence of things we need to do just to analyze expression array is more than one semesters or just enough one semesters worth of material so much that we would like to to analyze <coughs> excuse me 
Pardon me. Much that we would like to analyze different types of microarray, being chip, chip, or next gen, we will not have the opportunity to do that, you know, within our seven homeworks or within the lectures. But should you choose to do a project to to do what you're learning from here, but try to do that and apply that to a different platform of microarray, and and that's something that uh, closely represents the work you do. You know, you're very welcome to do that. So I so that was like on a what we will study and what we do not cover and sort of the roadmap you know of our course. Now first of all, why are we doing you know mRNA uh, expression microarray? So if we could count the number of molecules in a gene for each gene in a single cell, that would be an absolute measurement. And that's something you can do for by PT in RT-PCR, and that's a quantitative mRNA measurement. So let's just visualize, you know, what's an absolute measurement. So if you go to this file, by the way, the credit for this file goes to the professors from, um, I think they're from UT Austin, um, from Keith Begerly and Kevin Combius from UTMD Anderson Cancer Center. So they actually also offer a microarray course, and I will send you the link for their course. And there is another one from University of San Diego. They have a very good um, um, uh, course topics uh, geared to R and bi biconductor. So by the time you go to lecture three, you'll see a lot of the materials that I will share with you also comes from that course. So my, I'm with the philosophy if some material is well presented in an open source in some other university or some other forum, let's use it and let's get the best that we can from there so it makes our learning easier. So now going back to our absolute measurement and slide six, so if you visualize this particular slide, so over here in the graph, you have your gene, let's say gene one, gene 17, gene you know, 71, and if there was a way, you know, you could make these measurements where you can say, you know, in your cell, I had 5,000 copies of your gene one, or let's say I had uh, over here 25,000 copies of gene 171, that would be perfect, right? But in microarray, we actually cannot do these absolute measurements. What we do are relative measurements, and we'll come to that what we mean by relative measurements also. So what do we do in microarray? In microarray, what we do is we, bo we build a probe first to target the mRNA that we were trying to do an absolute measurement for. And the, all these probes are printed on an array. And again, much better to visualize a slide here than me talking through it. So let's go to the other one, which is pre-process AFI data slide. And again, let's give credit to the authors. I think it's Rafael Irizi. Yeah, Rafael Irizarry, he's a statistician. I think he also teaches, I believe, at Harvard, I believe. So, uh, and you'll see Rafael Irizarry and Robert Gentleman, they are the pioneers of bioconductor and they have done some tremendous work in this field. So many times, you know, we'll borrow from their slides for different topics that are complex and they give a lot of clarity to these topics. So, what we want to see here from, from slide three is what is a probe and what are we doing here? So this is the overall picture of your FMetrix gene chip, right? So if, you, if, if this is the uh, gene chip that you have, and within this gene chip you have an image of your array, right? And you look at a small section, right? And in this particular section, what you have in blue are the probes that you have printed on it. And what you have in yellow, and at the end you see the dye, so that's the mRNA that actually has hybridized to the probe that's printed you know, on this particular section. So that's the concept of what's, what's a probe and what's, what's your sample, and your sample is, uh, um, is, is dyed, and that's what we're showing you in this picture. Okay? So, if, so that's the Affymetrix platform. If you want to know about the cDNA platform, I give you a reference here. So please look in lecture one from page nine to 17. So what happened, the main difference between cDNA and Affy platform is, in Affy platform, you take a single array. That single array is actually has a link to a single sample. So you have one sample to one array. But cDNA array, it's a two color array, so you can actually use the same array, but one 
one of the sample you label with red and another sample you label with green. So the cost effectiveness of the cDNA is within one sample, one array, you can measure both the samples, but FE array for each of the samples, you need an individual array. So that's the basic difference, you know, between FE array and DNA platform. Now let's get into more description of you know what's an FE array and what's a probe, what's a probe pair, and what's a probe set. When I was trying to understand this several years ago, I was struggling to get the differentiation to say, okay, what is a probe, what is a probe set, and what's exactly a feature, and what's a perfect match, and what's a mismatch. So let's take all of this one at a time. First concept that we need to understand very clearly is what is a probe. So this you can visualize from slide 10. And let me take you to slide 10 here. <clears throat> so on slide 10, if you look at this, this one individual, and let me, I think maybe this is a better picture. So this is your mRNA. Right, that you have isolated from your tissue, or, or that's been uh, uh, that's in your sample, and the probe is designed with a sequence of maybe 11, 14, or 16 base pair that's complementary to your uh, to your mRNA, so they will bind together. So that's the concept, the biology concept of that. Okay, and so when you have a particular array, a section, and I'm sorry, let me go back to the page I wanted to 10. So this is one probe, right? So on this particular spot on your on, on your on your um, array, you will have many many copies of this probe, but they're all the same base pair or the same probe. So here you're showing one probe here. This is another probe. That's another probe. But this is actually on a feature, and I will describe you what's a feature. So that's the probe, and probe. And probe pair is you actually design one probe that's it's a perfect complement of the target mRNA that you have, so that you will call a perfect match. And with the mismatch probe, what you do is you actually change one base pair. So if you change one base pair, the target mRNA that you're expecting should not bind to it. But if it binds, then you know there's a crosstalk and something happened that shouldn't happen. So that measurement needs to be excluded and subtracted. So when you have a perfect complement between your probe and your target mRNA, that's called the perfect match. When you have one base pair altered and your target target mRNA should not bind to that probe that's called the perf that's called a mismatch and again perfect match and perf and mismatch you can visualize from slide 12 so let's get to that so this is the slide 12 right so over here you see these are the probe pairs right so one is pm and the pm is in the upper section here that's in red and it's in a feature the feature is what i'm showing you here in the rectangle white grid and mismatch is where you have one base pair that's different. So over here, it's, I would say over here, right? So this is different. So everything else you see is same, but in the perfect match, you had a base pair T. On the mismatch, you had an A. So this one together is called a probe pair. This one itself is a probe but it's called the perfect match probe. This one itself is a probe, but it's called a mismatch probe. The perfect match and mismatch together is called a probe pair. Each probe is located on a feature, and the perfect match feature and mismatch feature happens to be next to each other. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that now, up to this point, you understand what is a probe, and how the probes are located on a feature, Right, and how in a feature you can have many, many probes. It's not that you only have one probe. So if you go back to the slide here, you see if, if you consider this as a feature or a spot or a section on your array. So array, the best way I visualize array is like an Excel spreadsheet, right? If you look at this Excel, an empty Excel spreadsheet, let's go here, right? And I, let's say I draw a rectangle here. Okay, so that's actually an array. In, it's a row by column c concept. So your affymetrix array or your CDN array is no different. So if I come to a particular cell in Excel, so that's my feature, okay, or my spot. So in that feature, I have many, many probes, okay? 
So all these J, 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 each of them is a probe. And those probes are those complementary base pair, I think it's 21 sequence, 22 Mars, right? That's targeting your target as, as uh, mRNA. So that's your perfect match. And then you have your mismatch, which is that many probes. So this together is now, the, again, becomes a feature. And then you, so if the, so now let's go back and understanding the next concept, what is, what is a feature again? So if, if I come to this particular grid that what I'm drawing here, each feature actually has a 7 by 7 pixel. And what is a pixel, you can actually visualize from slide 32. So let's go to that. <clears throat> No, so that's prepare, I'm sorry, uh, to be slide 19, I suppose. Right. So if this is a particular feature, right, so each of this section, the grid is actually a pixel. So you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's your 7 pixel here. And each of this pixel can actually be scanned. And once you scan, you can actually get a measurement of the intensity of the color of that pixel. So when you measure this pixel blue, the value of this, what it will have, will be very different than this pixel, which is red. So if you think of that particular spot or feature, it's a 7 by 7 pixel. So you go 7 pixel this way, and you go 7 pixel that way. So this 7 by 7 grid is then called a feature. And inside this feature, you have the perfect match. And next to it, you will also have another 7x7 seven seven pixel, and then you'll have a, per and a mismatch. So that's one probe. Then you will have, going back to my Excel diagram here, so that describes the 7 pixel here, right? You have your perfect match and your mismatch. And let's say you location that as uh, 0, 0. So that's your 0, 0 coordinate. So it's your zero row and zero column. So next to it, then you have another seven by seven pixel. So which could be zero one, meaning zero column and zero row and first column. This is zero two, which could be your zero row and second column. Then coming down, it could be, you'll increase the row wise, so it could be your uh, second row and zero column. This could be your first row and zero column, right? So that's, that's how you go to the grid wise. So if you keep going down, each of these cells that I'm going through, there will be 640 of them. So, the, the, so now try to imagine the dimension of your array. You will have 640 features column-wise, or sorry, row-wise, and you have 640 feature column-wise. So it's in total a grid of 640 by 640, right? So uh, in essence, you will actually have half a million features, you know, in in your in your array. And each of these half a million, within this each of the half a million features, you'll have thousands of probes that, that are in each of these features. So just try to imagine the quantification here. And how many pixels there, right? So each of this grid is 7 pixels. So you'll have actually 640 by a 7 grid, which is about 4,500 by 4,500 grid of pixels. So go back to the slides, but I think, I made enough sense so you understand now how you start with a probe, then what's a probe pair between perfect match and mismatch, and how they're positioned in a feature, which is a 7 by 7 pixel, and then how you have a 640 of them this way and 640 of them that way. So that's your total dimension of the array. So now we talked about so far a single probe pair, which is a perfect match and mismatch. But the beauty in Affymetrix array is you actually don't have a single uh, uh, probe in the whole array. So what I mean by that, let's say you have a gene called Foxo gene, which happens to be my favorite gene these days. And then you know you have an mRNA for that, right? So you're targeting a probe, let's say GT underscore one. That's the name of your probe. But this probe will actually be distributed around 11 or some areas 16 or or some areas about 21 different location. And you can use easily visualize that from slide 32 that will clarify for you what's the concept of prepare. So if you now look at slide 32 here, oh, 
right? So these probes, so if this is, there are 16 of them. So if this is your total array, which is a 640 by 640 grid, and this is your first probe, that mean that it may be it's the same probe, it may be positioned here. Again, the same probe targeting the same RNA. Another one of them is positioned there. Another one is positioned there. So there's a random distribution of the same probe, but 16 of them at 16 different locations. So what you end up calling is those 16 of them belonging to the same target mRNA is then a probe set. Okay? So that was the last concept. I think it's a little hard, but I hope you, it, it was clear to you. And so you started with probe. You figured out what's a probe pair. Now you saw the picture of what's a probe set. You have an idea of the features, of the dimension, and of the pixel. And now let's look at the Affymetrix file structure. So when you start doing your homework too, which is your assignment too, your first thing that you will do, you will start working with the cell file. So, but let's understand what are the different files that Affymetrix has. The first file that Affymetrix has is the DAT file. What DAT file is, nothing but it just it's the data, the raw image data. When you get your Affymetrix, it just you know then you just scan over this particular uh, array. And for each feature that I was showing you, whether it's a 7 by 7 pixel, so you measure each, each pixel. So the quantification of the pixel image to data, what Affymetrix store, it's actually called DAT file. But you actually will never have to, you need the, the DAT file to do your homework or do your analysis. What you'll start with is a cell file. So cell file is actually actually a numeric quantification of the data that you have in your in your DAT file. So now let's visualize this from slides 24 to 27 about cell file. <clears throat> so if we go back here and go to cell 24, sorry, slide 24. So again, you saw that was the feature and that, that had the perfect match. This one had the mismatch. So these are the 7 by 7 pixel. So when you're running your scanner, you can actually get an image intensity summarized for all of these sections that's in your perfect match and for all of the sections that's on your, on your mismatch. Then on the next side, the way the quantification is done, they first zoom in for the scanning to a single feature, right? So you zoom in there. Then what you do, you actually trim the outside boundary. So you start with 7 by 7, but you, you notice in this particular file, the way the image is, your main redness or the main image of data where your mRNA for the probes have hybridized is actually in this section. So your outer boundary really doesn't will add any value to your intensity and the data for the uh, probe that you're trying to measure. So what they would do next is actually they will trim the outside. So that's gone. So whatever is left over, right? So each of this cell for our pixel will have a value. Let's say this has one, this is two, this is one, this is three, whatever. So you summarize all those values, you you list them and you order them, and you actually the Affymetrix algorithm is you pick the value that's the 75th percentile. So if I have a value, let's say one to 100, I'm just giving an example, right? And you order them. So 75 is the number that you will pick. You are not picking a mean. You're not. They are not picking a median. That happens to be the Affymetrix algorithm. If you think that there is a better algorithm that can be designed, that 75th is not, uh, you know, the the good way to go. Maybe that on its own could be a PhD topic for someone. But that's that's how Affymetrix is reporting the value after the trimming. It goes through the individual pixels, orders them, and and reports to you the 75th percentile value. So that happens to be a value of a single probe that's in a feature that's a perfect match. And it would do that for all the 400,000 feature that I talked to you about when you visualize the dimension uh, from your 640 by 640 grid. Okay, now let's look at how a, a cell file on its own looks like. You know, in task one, you know, we I was hoping that you would 
you know, look around to see without bioconductor, you know, how can you even open a cell file? That cell file is actually stored in a binary format. So you cannot open that with a notepad and other things. Probably Affymetrix has an Affy console and other tools, and there will be tons of tools out there which you can use to open a cell file and visualize it. But you will see those kind of topics are so easy, you probably need two or three lines of code in Bioconductor to open, see, and visualize data point within a cell file. So you'll feel much comfortable using Bioconductor, but I just wanted to understand what your experience has been in last one week or so to try to visualize or open, or whether you have been successful at all or not, to open the cell files. But let's try to look at it from the slides that we have here. And I think I talk about slide 21 and 22. So let's go there. <clears throat> So that so that's the first one on the cell file, right? So if you look at it, it has a 640 by 640. This is some of the thing that it's talking about in the header, and I explained to you what 640 by 640 is over here, right? And the first position that you have, the first perf uh, probe. Assume this is a perfect match probe. So that would be the location 0, 0. So that's again the 7 by 7. So I term it as 0 column, 0 row. Next one is 0, 1, which is 0 column, sorry, first row, 0 column. This one where my uh, cursor is right now for Excel, that would be the first uh, uh, row and first column, right? Something like that. So so that's that's the coordinate that it's showing you over here also, right? 640 by 640, and you start with 0 and 0. And um, if you go to the next slide, you will actually see at the 0 and 0 position, right, the mean that was reported was 133. That's your 75th percentile value. Remember when I showed you how you get rid of the outer boundary and you focus on the inner side and then you quantify all of those individual pixels, you sort it and you report the 75th percentile for each of those features. So that particular value is 133. Standard deviation, which we don't use and nobody needs it, happens to be 25. That number is sort of redundant, but you will never use it. And this locations hopefully made sense to you. So this is a 0 and 0 location, which is, let's say, this one. Next is 1 and 0. So 1 and 0 would be this one. And again, it makes sense when you go back to your cell file over here, you'll see the same thing. You'll have your coordinates, and you have your 75 percentile value for each of these probes. So that probe could be a perfect match probe. It could be a mismatch probe. It could be a probe for your FOXO gene. It could be a housekeeping gene. It could be a control gene. So then the question comes, how do I know which of these G, uh, probe, the value that's reported in the cell file corresponds to which particular uh, uh, target mRNA? And that's when comes into picture the CDF file. So the CDF file actually knows an affymetrics for each of these array that they have, be it an array that measures human genome, be it an array that measures a plant genome, they have, and in each location will always have the same probe. So if in location 1, 0, they are putting a house control gene, every single array for that particular array type, let's say it's an array type for human AGU133A. So that particular array type, AGU133A, at location 00, will always use a probe for, let's say, gene 1. At location uh, 300 by 7, it will always use the uh, gene uh, gene 7. So, you, so the locations are always constant, and what probe should be in what location is always constant. So as long as from the cell files you know the coordinate, whether it's 0, 1, 0, 0, or 340 by 7, then you can refer to the CDF file. The CDF file tells you what particular probes it happens to be. So you always, whenever you do your homework and other things, when you get the cell file, the most critical thing they need to answer is, what's my CDF file? Bio, uh, Bioconductor will automatically actually import a lot of these CDF files for you, but you have to give the correct parameter to say what particular array type you're using. It does not make sense if I give you an assignment to look at a data which has to happens to be uh, some microarray uh, done on some plant genomics, 
and you give a parameter or you don't give a parameter and you incorrectly import a CDF file that happens to be a human array, right? So all the analysis that you're doing, I'm sorry to say that, will be garbage. So you really have to make sure that the cell file that you're getting has the correspondingly correct CDF file because CDF file gives you the location of the probes or where they're located. Cell file gives you for those locations what are the values and once you get the values, then you get into the analysis of, you know, what's the statistical significance of it. Okay, so at 6.44, I, by 7, I definitely want to transition to introduction to R, so we can wrap it up by 8. I am going to get into a topic of normalization. I want to take a minute or two break, and let me see if there are questions. Anyone from, um, I think it's only two of you today here, or maybe I see participant four. I don't know whether there are additional people other than Alex or Steve. Uh, I think Stephanie is here. Um, is there any question from any three of you who are on call now? Am I going too fast, or did you not follow a topic in general? No, okay. So, sure. Yes, it's called Bioconductor Case Studies. It's from Springer. It's Florian Hahn and Robert Gentleman, but it should be in the syllabus. Uh, I, I mentioned that it's a required test textbook. Okay, great. That's the one I have. I just wanted to make sure. Um, I thought I saw something else earlier. Uh, there are some recommended textbooks, and I give some recommendation on book on R by Robert Gentleman. Uh, so that's a great book. You know, if you want to learn R in depth, that book gives so much, it's a great introduction. And I'm actually thinking of redesigning the assignment one from what I have done from past semesters, leveraging some of those techniques he has on, on that book. So the assignment that I'll post on Monday night on Tuesday will actually tell you to do some of the work based on the book that he has there. But it's just so, you know, it will help you if you have that to do it, but even if you don't, I will review it, the solution, uh, so you don't have to get it if you don't want to, but it's just a recommendation. Okay, and that, and that textbook was the introduction to R? Uh, I think R programming for bioinformatics, I think. Okay. I think, yeah. But it should be in your syllabus. Okay, so what I want to cover in next 15 minutes, and I think I need to be a little quick on this, but if I don't do a good enough job on this one, but maybe we can wrap up on the next uh, session that we have next Thursday, and it sort of ties to lecture two, so I will go do a very high level of this, but if you need a more deeper discussion on this, we can definitely do it next week. So what I need to be able to make sure you understand in next 10, 15 minutes is what do we really mean by normalization, and what is a summarization, and I give you one example of quantile normalization. And there are different techniques how you summarize data. There is RMA, GCRMA, VSN, DCHIP. And you'll see from your assignment 3 and 4 onwards, you'll say, OK, get your data and summarize by mass 5 technique or summarize by DCHIP and do a quantile normalization. Or I can say, you know, uh, <clears throat> So you are use the RMA method. So you have to know what those methods are on a, on a fundamentally what they're doing, right? So you can do that by reading the lecture too. And but let me try to give you some brief overview of this. So the first thing of normalization, simply speaking, in my simple mind, let's say you have an array, array one, and let's say this is with a sample that you're treating that is, um, I don't know, normal tissue. Right? It hasn't been treated with drug or anything. It's just a normal tissue. And then you have a probe 1 designed for gene 1, probe 2 for gene 2, probe 3 for gene 3, etc. And after you do your scanning right, and, and, uh, cell, and you look at your cell file, so cell file actually tells you that the probe 1, and it, let's say, assume for simplicity's sake you only have one probe. It's not a probe set. So we haven't talked about summarization yet. But let's say you have only one probe in the simple array. So this one's value happens to be 10, and this one 15, and the other one 13. Now you go back and look at your second array. 
And let's say in the second array, it's a sample that's uh, uh, maybe treated with a drug, or maybe it has some disease and whatnot, but it's different than sample 2. And you look at your probe 1, it happens to have a value of 100. Probe 2 is 150, and probe 3 is 100. So without just looking at it and just simply looking and thinking of it, you're saying, oh my, is there some expression that's so different here? Because, you know, it looks like the probe 1 and between these two samples has a tenfold change. Probe 2 has a tenfold change and probe 3 also happens to have a tenfold change. So just looking at the value like this way simply and without normalization, can give you false positive or will mislead you to believe that probe 1, probe 2, and probe 3 between these two arrays are differentially expressed. So you want to avoid that false positive or false conclusion. And the way to avoid that is, and, and why is that you could have a false, uh, you know, a result. So assume that, you know, I actually gave or, or print or uh, uh, the, the sample that I put into my array 2 was twice the quantity or 10 times the quantity that I put in my sample 1. It can happen. So just because I have put more samples, so linearly speaking, or proportionally, you, if you put more sample, you'll have more mRNA there, and if you have more mRNA, that means, you know, there are more... <clears throat> more of them hybridized to your probes, so when you're scanning it, your intensity will be also larger. So just because you have an abundance of something more in Array 2 compared to what you have in Array 1 does not necessarily mean that, you, that there's a differential expression going on, right? So, so that's why you actually have to do a normalization. And there are many techniques to do a normalization, but one of the simple ones to explain is how you can do normalization by a housekeeping gene. So for example, let's say your probe 2 is a housekeeping gene where it's not coming from your sample that, uh, that you're providing, but let's say uh, Affymetrix as actually has already printed the amount that it needs to be in each array when they send that from your slide from their uh, from the manufacturing. So when they when they did that, right? So the amount that they are having in in array one will actually be also the same that they're expecting or similar ratio that they're expecting in array array two. So if and these are the five spike controls that they're called on housekeeping genes, which is bio B, bio C, bio D, and, and CRE. So they know that they should have an increasingly large signal. So this housekeeping G CRE will always have larger signal than D, and C will always have a larger signal than B. And the ratio of these signals should always be the same between two arrays. So if this is, let's say, bio B, right, over here, and let's say this is uh, bio D, right, and bio B, and this is bio D, sorry, bio D, right? So bio B signal should always be greater than bio D. So in this case, yes, 15 is greater than 10. And bio B, and in this case also 150 is also greater than 100, right? But since they know that the ratio between bio B and bio D should be the same between, you know, between these two arrays, so the ratio of 150 by 10 and ratio of 15 by 10, you know, it's, it's going to be the same. So all you need to do in this scenario is you can actually divide this by 10, and if you divide this by 10, then 100 becomes 10, 115 becomes 15, and again 100 becomes 10. So after this division, what you realize, you know, actually there is no difference between my uh, uh, between the values of t of two arrays. So that's what normalization does by by doing by looking at these housekeeping genes. Affymetrix knows that bio B and bio D, based on the ratio it is, it's expected to be 100 and 150 here. It's expected to be 15 and 10 here. Then you figure out the constant in this scenario, which is 10. And once you divide it by the constant, what you do, even though array 2 had original values of 100, 150, and 100, but after dividing it by your constant, you normalize it to become 10, 15, and 10. 
And after the normalization, then you ask the question, is it still differentially expressed or not? In this scenario, as, you, as I'm showing you, it's actually not differentially expressed. So that's the simple concept of explaining normalization based on how skipping genes and how some of the spike controls with non known quantity and ratio are maintained between the arrays. So by just looking at them, you can actually adjust the values of all the other probes, and that's one normalization technique. Also look at the MNA-based uh, technique, which is if you take the arrays, individual intensity, and if you plot the quantity versus abundance, they should actually line up into a horizontal line and be close to zero. So if they are not close to zero, then a normalization is needed. So that's called intensity-based normalization. Now let's talk about summarization. Now let's visualize it from slide 35. What, what do we mean by summarization? <clears throat> and um, okay. So for summarization, so we talked about the concept between probe and probe prayers and probe sets, right? So if you look at a single point here, this is a probe. Let's say the red one is your mismatch intensity and blue one is your perfect match intensity. So then probe set would be 20 of those probes together, right? So you have probe 1 all the way to probe 20. Blue line is your mismatch and red, sorry, blue line is your perfect match and red line is your mismatch. So when you scan a particular array, so for this particular probe set, D11086 underscore AT, what you end up getting is 20 different values for 20 of those probes in the probe set. For mismatch and you get 20 different values for your perfect match. So you have actually 40 values. So what you want to do end of the day is actually report a single value for your probe set out of that particular experiment that you did on that array. So probe set D1186 probably should have a single value of, I don't know, 3000, let's say, something like that. So then how do you actually come and report that 3000? The most simplest thing that you can do to report it is you can sum up all the values. So let's say you sum up the value here, I don't know, 1000, 8000, uh, 3000, 8000. So you sum up all the blue ones and then you sum up all the red ones and you subtract from the blue the red and whatever and divide it by number of probes right so that's the value that you report that's the most simple technique and that's called a mass 4 technique avdiv right and you can visualize it from slide 12 so if you go back to here I'll show you the formula it's very simple it's just a summation of perfect matches and uh, and uh, summation of mismatches so you subtract the summations of perfect match of mismatch from perfect match and you divide it by the number of probe sets probes that were in that probe set but there is one problem of this uh, of this mass for you can have some scenarios where your red line which I was showing, or the perfect mismatch line, which I was showing you in this particular array, you can have your red line be actually on top of your blue line. It can happen where your mismatch, when you summed up your mismatches, that could actually report a higher value than you have from your perfect matches. So in those scenarios, you cannot and you do not want to report a negative value for your individual probe to begin with. That will totally throw off your analysis. Each value should be a positive in, uh, value. So then you can compare two positive between tissue of, of uh, 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 normal and disease, and then you can have a difference. But if you, begin, if you start with a negative, right, that doesn't make any sense. So you want to avoid the negative, and the way you do that, by adjusting the formula of mass 5, and you can actually look up the formula from slide 20, if it's not in the, it should be in the lecture too, but if you look at slide 20, that's the modified version of mass 5, where they use a the concept of tucky by weight. And all they are doing in tucky by weight formula is if you happen to have a mismatch that has a greater value of then perfect mismatch, then you feed it into this particular log value so that converts that and makes sure that mismatch value will be actually less than your uh, perfect match value. It's just a workaround to report and make sure that your mismatch value never exceeds the perfect match, but if it exceeds, you sort of 
push it through this formula so it returns a positive number out of that. So that's the difference that was made between mass 4 and mass 5. Finally, and I know we have two minutes, um, I would like to show you the quantile normalization. That's pretty interesting. And finally, what there is also the techniques of Li and Wang, which is called D-chip, and also the RMA and GCRMA. So thinking about RMA and GCRMA, I think we need to talk a little bit more about these on the next lectures. Um, but let me just show you simply what's the concept of the model base and it's very nicely explained on slide 42-46. So both RMA, GCRMA and D-chips are model based expression. So basically you look at all the values of your perfect match and mismatch across the chips and you come up with an equation to predict. A model in my mind is an equation to predict what the value of that particular probe, set, probe needs to be probe set needs to be out of that array. So you just don't do a simple addition and subtraction like you do in mass 4 and mass 5. It's a little more evolved algorithm to actually develop a model which as is a linear model uh, to predict you know what the value of those uh, uh, <clears throat> Probesets need to be, and it's very nicely explained from slide 42 to slide 46. And you can take a quick look. So when they look at it, so let's say you think about it, uh, you have five samples, right? So if you have five samples of the same type, right? So you will have five different arrays. In, as I mentioned, in FA matrix, each array belongs to a single sample. You cannot put two samples into one array. And in, within each of those array uh, that you have the sample, when you think about a probe level or a single gene that you're concerned now, they will all have about 20 probe sets coming from each of those array. So if you look into your first chip, you look at this first equation, uh, first graph, where the blue ones are your 20 different probe sets reporting the 20 different values for perfect match, and red one is reporting the uh, uh, mismatch. So it's sort of like a plot of a graph or whatever you want to call it. So the observation they, they, they made was when they looked at the plot of how the genes were expressed and how the values were measured for different probe sets at, at 20 different probe set location at the first array seemed to be very diff same when they also brought in the second chip. And also when they brought in the third chip, fourth chip, and they put together all the 10 chip, and in all 10 chip for those 10 samples, the probe set 14 reported the same value, the probe set 16 reported the same value across the all 10 chips. So once they made that observation, then they can say if it's the same value, then if somehow I can model this line, or I can have an equation for this line, then I can predict to say what's the what's the value that's a more most relevant based on this equation or line or model that I'm seeing across my chips. And that's basically all they're trying to do. They're trying to predict the value of what the perfect match needs to be and what's the value of perfect mismatch needs to be. So they assume they start with some thetas and alphas and whatnot and they iterate it till they can actually get to this line. And then you can look at your um, subsequent slides. You know how they're going back between um, uh, uh, going back between the slides and try to predict the equation over here. But we will not get into depth of these uh, of how they actually get into these models and equation because we'll mostly focus on R and knowing that this kind of capability is available. What's the end result, right? But if you're interested, um, you, you can take a look at that. And finally, I know we're two minutes over for the first topic. I want to show you a slide on quantile normalization, which is pretty neat. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look at slide 43 to 48 over in this particular one. So quantile normalization, the basic idea, and over here, this is not a normalization I showed simply where, you know, I looked at first slide 10, 15, uh, 20, and the second slide 150, 100, whatever, and I divided by 10, and that's how I normalize based on my housekeeping gene. So that's like the most rudimentary way to do that. The GCRMA and RMA technique, which is also a model-based technique for summarization similar to D-chip, actually uses this quantum normalization. 
right? So the first thing they do is they normalize by using the quantile normalization, then they model it for the summarization, and they report a value for you. But let's just understand, you know, how quantile normalization works, and this can be explained in this particular slide. What you first do, so each of these, let's say, is a feature, right? And let's say this is a value of your probe 1 miss perfect match. Maybe this is a value of your probe 1 mismatch, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's a 3 by uh, 5 array. Very simple. So the first thing they will do is they will actually sort it, so uh, column uh, row-wise. So you have 2, 5, 4, 3, 3. So if you sort it, it becomes 2, 3, 3, 4, 5. You sort it, becomes 3, 4, 5, 6. Sort it, becomes 4, 8, 9, and 14. Right? Then what you do, you take a mean row wise. So 2, 3, and 4 divided by 3, the mean should be 3. So you report all the means. Then 3, 4, 8. So you're actually taking mean across the array, across the probes. So 3, 4, and 8, the mean divided by 3. So 8, 4 is 12 by 3 divided 15 by 3 is 5. So that's your mean is 5. So for each of these row based positions, now you have a single mean. Now what you will do, you will go back to your original value and you will replace it with the mean. So your original value here is 2 and happens to be at the position 2 that you have, your mean is 3, so you, it gets replaced by 3. The second one is 5, happens to be 5 when it's here, its mean was 8, so you come here for 5 and you replace it by 8. I'll give you one more example. This one is 4, but if you look at 4 here, your mean at that line was 6, so you go back to 4 and replace it by 6. So that then becomes your normalized values. So that's the quantum normalization in summary. So that ends all of our lecture 1, this Excel topic that I wanted to familiarize with you. It may have been already very crystal clear to you by reading lecture 1 and part of lecture two, but I wanted to make this attempt uh, just so you and, you and all of us in the class are on the same page when we're talking about different terminology. So now we're going to move into R, some simple sessions, thinking of it as a calculator. So <clears throat> we can start working with R. Uh, were there any question? Is there some... Um, so Alex had question. I didn't follow that. It only takes one mismatch base to disrupt hybridization. That's what they they are saying, Alex. I don't have more theory for it, but that's what it takes. Is there some hybridization? Ideally, there shouldn't be any hybridization if you have one mismatch. They should not bind. I think it's a lot of structural things that's involved. So if you take one base pair out, the end structure of that mRNA and the probe is so different that they cannot. It's like a lock and key, right? If you have a little difference on your lock, then the key cannot get in. Uh, but I, I, I sort of, on a layman's term, that's the way I understand it. So there shouldn't be any hybridization, but if there is hybridization, then there is a crosstalk that could mean that a particular mRNA on the second, on, a, on, a, on a, an adjacent spot, you know, got also hybridized to this particular mismatch to which, you know, it, it had the same sequence. But summary of it is the target probe should not hybridize to your mismatch array and if it if and if you have any of those hybridization going on you need to discard it from your analysis and that's why when we summarize it we subtract it from the perfect match <clears throat> so let's uh, move on to r now So before we get on, I mean, I don't know, maybe some most of you have already installed R and, and, and whatnot. So what you can do, you can just simply start working with R with a text file, right? So I have a text file, and here's, I'm showing everything in Windows. I don't know if you work with Linux or Unix. It will be slightly different. But if you're already working with Unix, I don't think this session is any of use to you. Um, at any rate, um, what you can do for this particular lecture that I'm showing, I made up a text file. Okay, so let's say teaching r.txt. It's a simple text file. I can open the file, and in this file, I have some lines I have written. So to to go through running that, and you can do that same thing when you do your homework solution, 
or when you are reviewing the solution I have proposed or the pre-work to solution that I gave you which you need to practice before you can do your homework the first thing I would do, assuming you have got to the point where you have your R installed, I will go to File, right, and I'll go to Open Script, and then wherever my file was, .txt file, I can open it. So in this case, it's already open, right? So you have your R session, and you have your .txt file. That's your starting point. If you haven't already got R, this is the website to get to, which is cranrproject.org. In your um, uh, blackboard, I have uploaded a, f a folder under Lecture 1 called Supplement Document R. There is a file there called Introductory R Appendix.pdf. That particular file, if you are working on a Unix or Linux platform, will tell you how to do the install of R from your Unix based uh, uh, platform. If you're a Mac user, it also tells you how to do it at Mac. Uh, for simplest thing for many of us is Windows, and all you need to do is click on that zip file, unzip it, and it'll be installed on your machine. So that's I right now the way I'm sharing. This is a Windows based platform, so you see R open like that, and you have a text file as I showed you. You open it from your file and open script. So that's the first two step that you need to do. Um, to, to get into um, R and start programming with it. So what prompt that you see here is this uh, uh, greater than sign. So that's called the R command line prompt. Okay. So before you think anything more complicated, think of R as a calculator. So you have your calculator and you type 2 plus 2, it gives you 4. You say 37 by 7, it gives you some number, right? So what we mean by that, it's, it's interactive. You type something to it, it returns you a result. So if some of you have worked with MATLAB, or, or in this case, this is R. So this kind of uh, programming platform can be called an interactive uh, command line platform. That means I type something to R, it will give me a result. So that's what I mean by interactive. So we can start thinking of by, by a calculator. And the first thing, instead of a Hello World program, that you can do with these interactives, you can just type something and see what it does. I want to know from R, what is 1 plus 2? And R will tell me 1 plus 2 is 3, right? So that's your first code of line of code or program, whatever you want to call it, interactively you just did with R. Okay. So <clears throat> one thing I request for those of you who are seasoned programmers or those of you who are getting into programming and those of us who are in IT, we hate programs that doesn't have any code because it's a nightmare to maintain it because we don't know what was in his or her mind. There could be a bug and we spend countless hours debugging it to see where the issue is. So please, when you do your assignments or do anything that, in your project, each line that you are actually going to write a code, please precede it by a comment. So in R, you can actually do a comment by a pound to a sign, right? So if you write a pound and something else, whatever you want to write, that's considered a comment. So when R is going line by line to execute things that you want it to execute, it will not execute the comments. So always comment each line of code. Tell us what it is doing, what's your intention, and what's the logical grouping. Just don't throw us lines of code because what we really want to see is that what is that you tried to do, what is that that did not work for you, and the only way you can communicate that is by giving comments. Everything in R is an object. Okay, I can spend an entire lecture describing to you what is an object, right? But let's just first start very simply to say, <clears throat> um, I will assign a value, let's say I have a string called welcome to a microarray class for fall or maybe in this case it will be your spring 2011, right? Okay, so this string that I have, welcome to a microarray class, can be assigned to x and when it gets assigned to x, x on its own in R is an object. And what I want to accomplish in next 45 minutes for the remainder of the class is to take you through the different types of object that R has. So R has objects like vector, list, 
data frames, it has matrix, it has hash indexes, and, uh, sorry, um, environment as, as we know as hash. So let's just go through all those different types of objects to get familiar, to see how they're different. Then we'll do some simple calculation and plotting. Maybe we can write a function, and then maybe we'll give you some idea you know, what is a script. One easy way to execute a line of code, what I do is you highlight this particular line over here and on your computer you click Control R and I think there is a menu here called Run Run Line or Selection, right? Yeah, so you can do it from the menu, Run Line or Selection or, or you can just do simply Control R. So all I'm doing here is I have a text, it could be my name is Tomer, whatever, or welcome to this class and I want to assign it to X. So once I assigned it to X, now X is an object. I haven't told you what type of object it is, but you will soon find out what type of object it is after I describe you what are the different objects that are there in R. So again, I can select X, and if I do Control R, R will remember what X was assigned to. So as long as your session is open, R now knows that Welcome to Microarray class was assigned to X, so now in essence this object X has this value of welcome to microarray class. Okay, so that's going back from your doing some summation to something very simple and, and your concept of an object. Now let's work with some numbers. I want to generate 50 numbers that are randomly generated but it has a normal distribution and it will have a mean of 4. So I can accomplish that and just bear with me for some of those things that I will do now uh, <clears throat> which uh, would need a little more clarity by the time you understand what is a function. But assume that this what does for me, that I have a magic line that tells me that if you use R norm, which is R norm, and it has two things that I typed here. 50 means I want it to generate 50 different values and mean equals to 4 means I want it to have a mean of 4. If I wanted to have R norm generate 100 values, instead of 50, I would have put 100 here. If I wanted those 100 values to have a mean of 50, I would have changed the mean here. So that's the concept of parameter, right? So a function, which is R norm, will actually do something for you, a return a value for you. So that's actually, our norm in this example is a function. Each function has a parameter. Some parameters are required or some parameters are optional. So in this scenario, if you don't give the parameter 50, then the function our norm doesn't know how many numbers do you want me to generate. Do you want me to generate 1? Do you want me to generate 100? So if you don't tell our norm that, you'll get an error saying expected argument not met, right? So you have to understand that some arguments are essential, you have to give it. Some arguments are non-essential, right? So if you don't give a mean equals to 4, it's likely whoever has coded it to say, if you want 50 numbers and if you don't tell me anything else, if you don't tell me what the mean is, I will assume the mean to be 0, right? Or mean to be 1, whatever it is. Sorry, standard deviation is 0, mean is 1. So, so let's do that. So that's the function. It generates 50 values with mean of 4. So just so you get a feel for it, what it does. So it gets assigned now to an X object X. So X, which was initially my character, welcome to my array, now got overridden by a number, 50 of the numbers that has a mean of 4. So control R, and what is X then? So that's what X now is. So you see there are 50 different values that got generated. Now, one of the assumption here, one of the, uh, not the assumption, one of the requirement here is this 50 numbers that got generated has to have a mean of 4 and has, and has to be 50 of them. So R has a nice way of indexing it. So when you come to here 49, that means this is the 49th value that you're seeing. So the last one that's remaining, that's the 50th. So let's also verify, so I told the R norm function to generate 50 values with a mean of 4, and I know my x, so this is how my x looks like. But is the mean really 4, or is it like very close to 4? So you can double check that by using another function called mean. So you write a function called mean, and you put x as an argument inside it, right? So that gives you the mean. So actually in this case, the mean is 4.25. 
And you can keep repeating it. You know, in many cases, you'll see a mean which is 3.89. Sometimes you'll see a mean that's 4.1. So it's roughly equal to 4 since it's randomly generated. It's next to impossible to generate something exactly 4.0. Right, so it's, it'll be pretty close to four, but not four. But you can verify that by writing another function, which is mean. But you are not actually writing it. But I'm, I'm sorry for that. There are a lot of functions that sort of inbuilt in R that comes with R. So this function, which is generating 50 normal value, already came with R. So you just have to know about it. And the big question is, how do I know? That's what someone always asks. How do I know that there's a function called R norm? How do I know there's a function called mean x? So the way you know that is you can use this command called a purpose. So let's say you have a general idea that, you know, I wonder if R has something to do drawing a histogram or something to do about mean or maybe something to do about mode. So if you had doing something, think of it as a Google, and if you were to type it in a Google, so in R what you can do is type a purpose mean. So if you execute that, R will tell you these are the different types of function that's packaged in me and it's already available, then you can just say, you know, it, it seems to me this is the one I want to use, which is mean. If your requirement was something that you wanted to do something with time difference or row means, not the column means, then you could have used the other functions, right? So mean dot default mean is the same one. If you wanted to do column mean or row mean, there's also other inbuilt functionality R has that you could have used. So this is a very powerful one, a propos. Um, <clears throat> I use it a lot. So what's, once you don't know what to use, that's your first starting point. And so let's say, so you know that's how you have to use the mean. And let's say I want to find out in my 50 value that I generated, what's the lowest value and what's the highest value, right? So function for that is range. Then again, it's a matter of either looking at the R reference card. I think I have uploaded in your supplemental doc. You'll see there's a document called R reference card. That's a very useful tool which you can print and kind of leverage it that gives you a very quick guide to say what's available and what's out there already for R. So you can. that's a very easy way to find out about a function. When you're new to a programming, the first thing is you just sort of need to know what's there and once you practice it it becomes ingrained on you but since you don't know you can either get to know it by typing a purpose or print out the reference card to say what's already there and in the reference card you probably will definitely see the range function that tells you you know what <clears throat> how to find minimum and maximum values so if you do that sorry uh, yeah so if you do the range x right so it tells you the minimum value of your 50 was 1.98 and the maximum was 6.7. That's how it's in this range. So how about doing a histogram? Either you can find that hist function is there by searching in R or from your reference card, whichever works for you. But very easy, R right away draws a histogram for you. So over here in the histogram, you can see that just like a normal distribution or a bell curve, you talk, 4 is right there in the middle. That's roughly your mean. You have some values that's less than 2. You have some values on the tail that are greater than 7, uh, greater than 6. So that's a very nice bell-shaped curve, and you can draw a histogram of that. So another question on, on help, right? So you know what you want to use, which is a mean function. Uh, and you get that from your reference card or a purpose. But let's say you want to know that how does the mean work? You know, what are the different arguments that's required in mean? And can you give me some example, you know, so I can try myself to see, you know, how mean works? What I do is you question the mean, right? So what you do is you type question or another command is help. You can type help and in parentheses you can say mean. But easy one, which I prefer, is I just say, let's question mean. So once you question mean, you will see a web page will open up shortly. <clears throat> and in this web page, it tells you what's, what's the mean, right? So that is your default. So that's your required parameter, x. That means you have to give mean minimum a ob number of how many, you know, what's the object based on which it will calculate the mean. 
So you have to give those 1, 2, 3, or 7, 8, 9, whatever number of things you want to calculate the mean for. You have to supply that object. Then there are some additional argument to say, you know, do you want me, when you report the mean, do you want me to trim a certain of those value up to two digit? Or in your data set, if you have seven values, but one of them is missing, do you want me to remove the, uh, that missing value? So, so those additional arguments which is not required, you can find that help or definition here on the mean um, page. And what's required, you can also find. And at the end, what I always do is I do an example. So this example tells you that I assign a value of x, which is a c. I don't know whether I covered c already, but I will. c is a collection, and I'll come to that. So it's a collection of 0 to 10. Right, and then you give that, and you calculate the mean on on that x. So always try to look at the example and practice that. At the top, look at what's the argument that's required at the minimum. What's your additional argument, and what are the description of the additional arguments? There is no better way that I know of that you can learn how individual functions within Bioconductor or R works, other than questioning them like the way I showed you, question mean, and then try to follow the Vignet, which will be a topic a little premature right now, but you'll see there's a lot of practical examples given and PDF files you can directly generate from the AFI, from the Bioconductor Library that will tell you how to do things. <clears throat> so so you, you definitely need to do this kind of investigation and as you learn R and as you get into Bioconductor and use these techniques. So now, Let's let's move on understanding you know what are the different types of objects you know that um, uh, that we have in R. So there are different objects as I mentioned. There are vectors, there are matrix, there are lists, and etc. So the most simplest, <clears throat> the, the first object that you need to understand in uh, in R is object type vector. Okay. So in vector, what happens? Every single element that builds the object. So what I mean by element. So let's say I have. I talked to you about 50 normally distributed value, right? So it has 50 different elements. And they're all numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 50. So one, what vector is, all the elements that are consisting or getting assigned to this x has to be the same type. So you cannot have in a vector a number 1, 2, 3, and x, y, z, which is a character. You cannot have x, y, z character and some uh, uh, logical value called true and false. So you, it cannot be like that. So all of them has to be same data type, meaning all of the elements either has to be a number or has to be a character or has to be some logical values of true and false. So <clears throat> object type vector, so the first example is numeric. So what I'm doing is let's take 10, 20, and 40 and assign it to an x, which is an object. Since 10, 20, and 40, all of them are a number, right? And I'm assigning to an object here y, so the object type here is vector. So that's the most simple definition of a vector. And c is a collection. All it's doing, it's an inbuilt uh, uh, R function, uh, function where it collects the 10, 20, and 40 together. It's a container, you can say. Let's put the 10, 20, 40 in a container and assign it to my object y. So that object y will now become my vector y. Okay? And c is the way you do that, the container function. You can also write this container function to construct a vector, which will be this time not numeric, but this time it will be character. So let's say I have three gene names, Foxo, A beta 40, MT1, whatever. A beta 40 is a protein, by the way. So you take all of this, right? And you assign it to gene set. Right? So now gene set is an object. As I said in R, remember, everything is an object. Question is, what type of object? The object here, again, is vector because they're all of the same type character. Last example is logical vectors. Logical vector is a Boolean sort of vector type. Boolean is nothing but either it's a 0, 1, meaning true or false. So the way it's done is T or F. So you, it will be either T or F. You cannot have T, F, F, T, comma, 7. That will break the rule of vector because it's different data type. It won't work. It won't be a vector. So it has to be the same type. So if you do that, control R on M, and now if you select M, you'll see it's true, false, false, and true. Any question on the most primitive, I shouldn't call primitive, but the most uh, simple 
uh, object type in R, which is a vector. R console and R editor. I haven't thought about this question. R console is when you open up an environment or a session, everything that I am doing over here, right? So that's getting recorded in your console or your environment. So R is remembering it. So a long time ago, I did X, right? So if I type the X, it remembers the 50 distribution that I created. So that's your console. The editor is when I actually come here, I am using that R editor to type my commands. And when I execute that command, that command is reported into the console. So that's the difference. Editor is where I'm actually typing things or telling R to do something. And in the console is actually doing the calculation and reporting to you what it did based on what you typed on editor. That's the relation. <clears throat> OK? So I assume there is no question on vectors. A vector is the most simplest type, either number, character, or vector, or, or uh, sorry, or uh, <clears throat> logical. Now let's look at list. But I uh, just want to make sure I didn't <clears throat> miss something. So once you have this <clears throat> vector, which was y, what was y? So y was 10, 20, and 40. That was my example of the uh, minim, uh, of the uh, numeric type vector. Then you can do a lot of operations on this vector by, again, calling the function. So now you can say, what's the length of y? It should be 3, right? So you can say length of y, 3. Minimum should be 10, right? So it gives 10. What's the square root of y? That's interesting. So when it does the square root of y, remember, y is not a single entity like 10. It's 10, 20, and 40. So when a square root of y is actually called on this vector y, it's actually applied through all elements. So it squares roots the 10, square roots 20, and also square roots 40. So just a different way of thinking. It loops through all of them and applies it to all of its elements. There are some lot of techniques, and you can find it you know, on that, some of the documents I've uploaded. Uh, interesting techniques of generating values from 1 to 9 incremented by 2. So the simplest way, you, again, you use the sequence function, right, from, and again, you find it on your R reference card. I want to generate something from 1 to 9. I want to increment it by 2. So what happens here? Why? So if you look at it, so 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. So all of them is incremented by 2, starting with 1 all the way up to 9. <clears throat> now let's talk about accessing some elements particularly, right? So let's say I want to now generate a sequence which is from 100 by 1, length equals to 20. What does it do? Let's run it and see what it did. So it started from 100. So it incremented by 1, right, from 100. So that's your starting point. Length is 20, so it will do up to the 190. So you can index it and see that's your length 20. By equals to 1, that means your delta that it did between any two elements is 1. So that's what x did. So now, if that is x, how do I get my third element? So this is first element, second element, and third element, right? So that's my x. How do I get that? The way you get that in in <coughs> is by x3, right? So this particular one over here, that's an array notation. If Maybe some of you know it very well. So this we called, in classical programming, an array index, right? So this is the notation you use, two square brackets. And if you want the third element, so you type 3 there. So, it will, so that's your index. So that will then return the third element out of the x. There are three different things, and it will be your homework. I probably show it somewhere where you can access elements in array: bracket, double bracket, and dollar. So one of the question I might ask you is to say, what's the difference between these three? When will you use dollar against when will you use this double dollar, double bracket against a single bracket? So that's definitely one of the question I'll post on your homework. <clears throat> Okay, so if I want to access the third element, I do that. If I want to access from the first all the way to fifth, what I do is I use a colon type signature here. So if I use a colon, it actually tells me from 1 to 5. So now it returns to me from 100 all the way up to 104. So that's your x1, 1 to 5. 
So um, this is the same thing. Um, just okay. So a vector, as I said, it only has the same data type. It has a number, and it can be only a, a character or it only be logical. But sometimes just having a number is not useful. Maybe I want to see in a context to say what's the name. If I have three numbers like 5, 7, and 8, right? So what does 5 represent and what does 7 represent? So it could be like, you know, you're uh, collecting some data on a demographics. So let's say the demographics say the weight was 160 pounds, the height was, you know, 20, uh, 72 inches. So you have these numbers called 72 and 180. So you want to know what was 72 for and what was 180 for. So even though they are numbers, you want to assign a name to them. And the way you can assign a name to them is, so let's say this is Joe, right? Let's say Joe is age 24 and 1.7 meter, I guess, I don't know, meter? <laughs> Very tall perhaps. 1.7 meter um, uh, or something, you know, is his height or whatever. So then this is the two numbers, right? Uh, Joe, right? So now if I look, so Joe is an object. So what type of object it is? Vector, because both of them is number, 24 and 7. So if I look at Joe, right now it's reporting 24 and 1.7. But it's not telling me what's the context of 24 and what's the context of 1.7. So if I look at it, <clears throat> at the names function, it's not returning anything. It's null. It doesn't tell me what does 24 means and 1.7 means. So what you can actually do, you can actually use the names function right, on the vector Joe, and you can actually say the first element will be age and the second element will be height. right? So that's what you do. Names Joe. Now, if you look at Joe, it's much more interesting. Instead of reporting just 24 and 1.7, it's saying the age is 24 and the height is 1.7. So the vector comes in the context of being the numeric to elements, two of them. On top of that, you can also assign the name, age and height, but don't confuse this name, age and height, as a, as a, uh, in the, as a, as a, sorry, as a text or as a character type vector. It's just a label of those numerics that you have. <clears throat> okay, so that's enough on vector. So now let's move on to list. So the, the next logical step that you want to do, and I want to find the section where I took some note on list. <clears throat> list. Okay. So that's the second level up. So right now I don't want to collect all these numbers separately in one vector and another character into another vector. What if I have a data that some of them are number, some of them are characters, some of them are logical. So if you have an object and you want to store that object in a manner where the data types are of different types, and different sizes, then you can actually leverage list. So if you have a value where you know it's Joe, that's that's someone's name, his height happens to be 1.7 meter, and you are also capturing his uh, birth date, right? 1960, etc. <clears throat> so that birth date over here is actually a character, right? And, and so the, this Joe is actually a number. Sorry, oh, sorry guys. Joe is a character, 1.7 is a number, and date of birth is a collection of individual numbers that actually construct the date. So all I'm saying here, these are different data types. They're not all numbers, they're not all characters. So if that's the case, then leverage the list, and the way you construct the list is you prefix it by a list. For vector, you use it by a C. That's all you need. But for list, you need to explicitly say list, Right, so it knows it's not a vector, and you can still use the C, which itself on its own is here a vector of number. This is a vector of number, this is a vector of uh, character. But since it's between vector number and vector character, they're all together. If you want to store them, you store them in an object called list. So, you, you, classical programming wise, you think of these are all talking about data structures, right? And how do you want to store that data? 
and how do you want to retrieve the data so I showed you the simplest data structure which is vector now I'm showing a little variation where there are different data types so now that becomes uh, your list so that's how you construct the list which is by the list command now let's look at list L right I assigned it to L so L is an object so what type of object L is L is a list so now if I execute list what it does you will see it shows the individual element prefixed by a dollar right so it's saying in my list L the dollar ID right which is the name remember right in a vector but we showed you the name the name ID has a value of Joe the name height is 1.7 and name DOB is this one so this is dollar so if you want to now access a specific element within the list to say I want to know what's the height uh, on this list so in that scenario you can actually prefix it by dollar height that will give you this 1.7 if you said dollar date of birth that will give you 1960 etc okay so <clears throat> if you want to for any reason unlist it and show it see it as a as a vect individual vectors you can actually say now I don't want to see it as a list because whenever you want to see as a list you see this different way right you have one three lines dollar dollar and dollar but if you want to see a plain view what you can do you can just say unlist L so it's not a list anymore right but the visualization the way you will be represented the data will now become a column and then under each column you'll have the values so if you want to see the value the list in this manner which is sort of like a frame which I'll come to very soon you can unlist it but if you want to but the, but the original way the list shows the value will be in a three uh, the individual names will be broken out in different uh, rows here um, <clears throat> If you want to append to a list, um, so let's say I have a new list called L1. So each list begins with the list, right? And who is the name is Fred. So let's say I make a new list which is L1. So L1 in this scenario will be just Fred. And let's say I want to concatenate Fred, which is L1, with L. So all I do is I do a collection, which is container, of L1 plus L now you will see on your list Fred gets added the L1 gets added to L but so C is a very powerful the container function is very powerful so initially you had the original list L which had Joe 1.7 1960 now that you added or concatenated Fred to it so Fred also got added to your list L1 so L1 is a concatenation of the L1 originally plus L so that's that's how you can append to a list then you can also delete a list right so if you set a particular item to null right then you can actually delete it so if I execute this code here L1 I want to set the height to null so if I do that and next time you you run your L1 you'll see the height is gone all you'll have is who ID and date of birth so useful techniques you know how you add something to a structure how you remove something from a structure how you access a specific element from a structure and this is very crucial for bioconductor when you get into your homeworks to say you know you want to know a specific gene or a specific probe ID and when you come to think of it, think of it, your uh, FMetrics data for a file would be nothing but in the uh, columns you will have lots of samples, and on the uh, on the rows you will have all those probe names. So it's a matrix type of data structure, which I will cover soon. And then you have to know how to access a particular element, how to add el values uh, to a file, how to delete values from it. So these are the, some of the techniques that you have to practice and make sure you know you're comfortable before you get into a much more complex uh, task in the next few weeks. Now we talked about uh, vector, we talked about list, and there is another concept which is called uh, frame, and give me one second. <clears throat> so I want to make sure factors, so we talked about lists. Um, and we talked about factors no not yet data frames so data frame is a special kind of list where all elements and vectors are of same length okay so when you look at this particular list here that I just showed you which is uh, 
the date of birth one. So let's just show you the data frame, what I mean by same length. So you have, I'm, I'm constructing a list, right? So first thing is, they're, they're initially to begin with, they'll be all vectors, right? So these names is a collection of Joe, Fred, Harry. They're same data type. So names on its own is actually a vector up, up until now. So if you look at just names, right? Joe, Fred, Harry. So this is just a vector. Then I have another vector of all the numbers. So that's age. I have another vector of all the heights. So that's height. And I have another vector, which is a Boolean, sorry, a logical vector, students, which is true, false, false, right? Now, what I can do is if you look at these names, age, height, and student, they all have three elements, right? So what it has to be, each of these vector, each of them has to be a vector, and the number of, uh, and the length have to be the same. So special types of list where all elements are vectors, right? So name is a vector, age is a vector, height is a vector, student is a vector. So that condition is met. Second condition is all of their length have to be the same. So it has to be a matrix where it's to match up. The, num the length has to match up. If I had an additional one here called whatever, true, it would no longer be a data frame because you have four here, but everything else of the vector had three. So that's what I mean by the vectors of same length. Each of them vector, but the length have to be the same. So the way you construct a data frame, so the list when you're constructing it is a list. Each element can be different. The length of the element can be different. So that's list. But if you have a data structure, right, where all of them are vectors, but the length are same, a more efficient storage, and many times you will see many of the data you will process, whether it's a mass spec or proteomics or gene expression, it's always pretty much the same length and same data type, same or vec each column are the same data type. So it's a row by column. So whenever you're reading an Excel file, you want to, as, as you know, they're the same data type and same length, each of the elements, then you actually want to construct a data frame. And I'll show you shortly how to read an Excel file and how that file becomes a frame. But that's the concept of the data frame. So instead of list, you prefix it by data.frame, and that's how you run it. And now if you show your D, so, so that's your frame. So these are individually were all vectors, but they all have an element of three. So that qualified to meet the condition to become your data frame. Now I want to talk to you about factors and levels. So factors are levels is also um, a special kind of list, list, but what's different here is you, it's, it's talking about a categorical data. So for example, you know, you have a data set where it's talking about the weather. So let's say the weather is stormy one day, windy another day, icy another day, but there are only so many different things that can happen. You talk about season, right? You can have many different months, it's, but it's either spring, winter, or summer, or etc. Or let's say, you know, I'm grading someone end of the semester, but even though I grade everyone as excellent, but let's say, you know, you have a grade where some student got good, some student were poor, some student were bad, but when you look at it, ultimately the categories here are either A, B, or C, that is good, poor, or bad. Right? So instead of storing all of them as a good, good, good many, many times, you can just simply store it as, as a single value called A. Right? So it's a more efficient storage if you want to store it based on a category. So whenever on your data set you want to show a distinct category or, or levels, then you use, then, then you, then you use the factor. So in my example, I have a collection of many different uh, texts of good, poor, bad, but many of them are repeating. So that's actually a vector, right? So the score itself. And if I want to know now what's the uh, uniqueness, what's a distinct is, is a rather good way. And those of you who know SQL, that, that's what we do, right? Select distinct. So the way you do distinct in R is you use the command factor. So the score itself is a vector which is a character vector, but if you use the factor around it, right, so that becomes a data type where now this good, poor, and bad, instead of being stored as good, 
uh, hair and good hair, it will be actually stored as one for good, and poor is two, and bad is maybe three. So, so it's a different way of storage, right? It assigns a unique number. So now good becomes one, poor becomes two, and bad becomes three. So the storage would be one, two, three, two, uh, three, three, one. So you, you have a much better storage of storing something as one, two, three than to store something as good, poor, and bad because you have more space you need for characters and you need much more, much less space uh, to, to store something as a number. So that's the first thing factor does. Stores everything by number and assigns something number. And if you want to know what's the unique values of it, that's the distinct, you use the function called level. So now that you have you are storing the scores, which was originally a vector, as a factor, right? And then if you do a level on that factor, you will get to know what are the distinct categories you have, which is bad, poor, and good. Male, female, different types of tissues, right? Disease or normal. You can have like 1,000 samples, but end of the day, if you run a level on it, or your phenotype or whatever, you can just say either it's a normal tissue or a disease tissue. So important to understand, you know, what factor does, you know, what kind of storage factor converts to, and how you can use the level command to understand what are the distinct values that are under the factor. Okay. The final data structure that I want to uh, cover today in uh, essence of time, I would really like to end it by eight. So. We will cover the matrix. Maybe in the next session, we'll talk about the environment, which is the hash indexing that you have, and the array. So array. once you understand matrix, array is much easier. It's just a bigger, more, more dimension. But in math, when you think about linear algebra, if most of you have taken it, a matrix is just a grid of rows and columns, right? So in math, it's a two-dimensional array of numbers. So let's say you know I have a single number called 1.6. Right? So that's a vector, we know that. Now you can actually say, write a func you can use a f uh, R's known function where you can actually validate to say what type of data it is. Is it a vector? Is it a list? Is it a data frame? Is it a matrix? So same function you can use called is.matrix. So you and I, we both know that X is not a matrix. It's just a number. Uh, it's a vector. So if I say is.matrix X, it should return me false, right? because it's not a matrix. So you can actually f understand what's the data type by using the function is.matrix. And as you see, when you did is.matrix, it actually returned a false. Now what's the function? What's the call? How you construct a matrix? Remember, vector is done by C. Uh, list is done by list. Frames is done by data.frame. Then you just saw how factors are done. Then you just saw how you can find the levels on a, on, on, of a factor. Matrix is constructed by the prefix called matrix. So if you do a matrix, which is 1.6, and 2 by 3 gives you the dimension. So every matrix needs to see how many rows you have, how many columns you have. right? So if you do this, 1.6, 2 by 3, and let's just see what happens. So once you do that, and you look at x, so what did it do? 2 by 3, that means it has two rows and three columns, right? Two rows, three columns, and 1.6 got populated in each of these spots. So in this manner, x is now a matrix. But when it was a single value, it was not a matrix. So can we validate? Is, is dot matrix x? Yes, so this time it is true. But when you initially had just the 1.6, it was not. So that's how X looks like, and that's the definition of a matrix. There are metrics are constructed many different ways. You can construct a matrix by populating the rows first, meaning you go through rows, you know, then you go to the next row, or you can populate the first column and then you can go to the next column. So that's why we have when you construct a matrix, you can either do it by row bind, which is R bind function or you can also leverage the C bind, which is the column bind function. So in this particular example, I'm collecting 149, which is a vector, 268, 321, but I want to construct a matrix by row bind. So if you can visualize what it will do, the first row of the matrix, it will be a 3 by 3 matrix, right? Because uh, that's, that's, that's how it is. You can already visualize. The first column, it will populate 149. So first column is 149. First row, it will populate 149. 
first column is 1, second column is 4, and third column is 9. But let's see it, you know, how it happens, so it'll be easier for you once you execute it. So now that you look at x, what did it do? 1, 4, 9 was inserted in the first row, 2, 6, 8 in the second row, and 3, 2, 1 in the third row. So that's your row bind. But if you do column bind for the same values, it'll be different and much easier to look at it so than to talk about it. So when you do the column bind, so 1, 4, 9 got the first column, right? 2, 6, 8 became the second column, and 3, 2, 1 became the third column. Transpose. Transpose is a very interesting function. So where you basically make the rows into columns and columns into rows. So if, if this is the x and if you want to transpose it, so you just use tx, right? So now 1, 2, 3, which was a row here, became a column here. Okay? And 1, 4, 9, which was a column here, became a row there. So, so that's the functionality of transpose. If you want to know what's the dimension of a matrix, so over here I know the dimension is 3 column by 3 row. You can use a dim x, so that's 3 by 3. And all the microarray data that you will process, they'll all be matrix. They'll all have dimensions. And you'll see when you go into bioconductor, you're always seeing, like, you know, after you start with, what do we start? We start with, like, 15,000, no, 23,000, uh, sample, sorry, uh, probe sets or features across, let's say, 14 samples. So that's a matrix of 14 by 23,000. Then you do some statistical test on it. Let's say you do a t-test, uh, sample t student t-test, and you try to see whether the genes are really expressed or not. Then that may become from uh, 23,000 gene, maybe it becomes now 5,000 gene. That's, uh, you know, b b crosses some threshold. So your matrix now becomes a 5,000 by 17. Then you do some annotation on it and some go test and things you will learn in next 10 weeks, that matrix now becomes a 100 gene by 14 matrix, right? So it's all about matrix. It's a very important data structure, and we'll leverage this a lot in Bioconductor. I have never used array in Bioconductor, but I still like to mention to you what it is. Very rarely we use hash type structures, which is the environment, but there are some uh, apply this function where a hash is useful. So it's a very simple topic, but I would like to cover it next week. So that those are the only two remaining stru structures that I am aware of. But matrix is important, data.frame is important. Now I want to show you how do you read and write to a file. Very important. Very, very critical. Those of you who are new with R, and I've seen in the past those who didn't program really struggled with it. The first thing that you have to really understand is R doesn't know by default where are you keeping your files in your work in the Windows working directory. It doesn't know. You have to tell it. If so what what we will be trying to do with R is we will give it an input file, which could be our cell file, right? For bioconductor. It will process those cell files. It will tell you what things are expressed and what not. But it will not know where you're keeping your cell files. You have to tell R what's the directory, you know, where those cell files are located. So the first thing you want to check is by default, what's the working directory? Right? What's the directory that R by default has pointed to? So in my case, since my session was open, it happens to be C colon slash R. So if you look at my Windows folder over here, right? So I have different folders here. Okay? So in this folder, so under the C, which is my root folder, I have created a folder called R. And that happens to be my, my default directory right now. You may have a complete different structure, right? So Knowing what the get working directory is and assume that you are putting all of your file under the folder called Oracle, whatever, and you want to process all your cell files from there. So then what you have to do now, you have to use the, co the command set working directory. Right? So you have to say set working directory and then C colon slash Oracle. So very critical. So don't forget this. So if you first figure out what's the default directory, if that's not the directory you want to work from, if that's not where you want to put your files, make sure to issue the command set working directory and type it in with double code and code with C 
colon backslash right is it forward slash forward slash forward slash the directory that you want on your on your windows explorer or assuming that's where you're working from from a windows platform you can give that directory if you so so i know that my particular working directory is under r folder so if i want to now see what are the different files that's kept under my directory i can just issue the dir column right so as you can see you know i have some pdf files some html files uh, I have lots of cell files that I have kept here, which we will process later in the course. So, right, I know that I have an uh, Excel file called player.csv, which is something very simple, which is I list out the names of some players and what, how many goals they have scored, maybe in a soccer game. Um, I have the names and, I, and their team they play for and how many goals they have scored in that season. Right, a simple, silly uh, example of some data. So that particular file is stored in players.csv. So your assignment, you know, you'll see would be okay. You have an Excel file, so put it into a directory and open it. Right, open the Excel file, and once you open it, it has to be one of the objects that we talked about. Most likely, the Excel file will be a data dot frame type object. It could be a matrix object, right? But so first you have to tell R where your Excel file is, and then I show you how to open that file. So you, <clears throat> so in my case, I'll keep it as my working directory as R because that's where I know my CSV file is. So the command that you issue to open up a file is read dot table, right? So you say read dot table, then you give the name of the file, and you have to tell once it's reading the file right so it could be an excel file it could be a text file so if it's a text file you know you can have some columns that are separated by a space csv is a comma separated file so that so you know each column that you have in the file is separated by a comma you can also have a text file that's separated by a tab so just giving the file name is not sufficient you have to tell r that how do you distinguish in the file from one column to one column so that's where you give the separated uh, by. So in this case, will be comma. And does your file has a header, right? Because when you think of a file, you can have player, goal, team split. So that's your name. And then followed by that, you have a bunch of names and numbers. So that's actually your data. So if your file has a header, you will say true. So that means the first line it sees, it will consider it as a true. So that's this very simple. You read that, which is X, right? So now let's look at X. So that's what it is. So if you look at open the CSV file, you will see that's what how many columns I had: players, goal, score, age, team, right? They're all separated by a column. So they said so they all got read. And by the way, ignore this uh, line that you get, which is incomplete final line. So what happens is R, it comes to the first line, knows this is a header, goes to second line. Right, knows everything separate by a comma, goes to the fourth line. When it comes to the fifth line, it doesn't find anything. So it's a terminating character. So if you don't, the way the read dot table is constructed, it doesn't have, it doesn't tell, it doesn't tell the function where to terminate. So when it comes to the fifth line, it actually doesn't find any more commas or anything to separate. So it says the final line is incomplete. But it's it's just a warning that's coming out of the read dot table function, and in many cases you'll see this error in R when reading an Excel file. It's a no harm error, but it's just happening because when the last time the cursor was after the fourth line, it did not find any more of those separation, so it just says incomplete. And your last line will always be incomplete because you don't have any data there, so you can ignore that. <clears throat> And so that's how you do the read dot table. And if I want to, so now this becomes is actually a data frame, right? So in, remember, in list, everything is separated by a dollar. So so this is an item in the list. Data frame is a list. So this is a dollar goal, goal score. This is a dollar age. So if you want to extract out of this file only the age, right? So x is where you read dot table. By default, when you read dot table a an Excel file, it becomes a uh, data frame, and you can validate that. It is a data frame, which is a special type of list because you have the each of them is a vector, and all of them are same number. 
you have four items here, four items here, and four items here, right? So that qualifies to become a, a data frame, and you can validate that. And interesting thing is, if you want to figure out just a single element, let's say I'm only interested in the age column here. I don't care about the team and goal scored. So the way you access a single element is by prefixing it by x dollar, which is the column name age. So that's how you get that. Let's say I want to order it by descending order, right? So I can just say x order on the column dollar age. So now everything is sorted by, by the age. Now that is sorted, let's say this is the version now I want to write and save into my CSV file. Right? So then you say write.csv and give the name of the file through which you can save to and the web, and the data frame that you just modified which you want to send out to. So that's very simple. You just use write.csv. So this is read.table, this is write.csv, I showed you how to get a, a, an exact element, how to extract it, and how to do some ordering on it, and I think we're running out of time, so, so there are only two other concepts that uh, once I loaded this particular text file, practice it line by line, you know, once it's uploaded in the uh, uh, Blackboard, so you can actually make sure that it made sense and you can follow up from the recorded session that I'll be uploading. I will not have enough time today to go through the apply family and the print functions, but let's just uh, do that the next time we meet uh, on um, uh, Thursday. So if you have a follow-up question and as you are practicing with it, it did not make sense or you're struggling, uh, please feel free to um, contact me. I'd like to limit the sessions to two hours. If it's a topic that's very that I'm in the middle of but that's important for you uh, to get to the homework, I don't mind going up to two and a half hours or even longer. But for now, I think you have more than enough information to understand what microarray is. Make sure you understand what is a probe, probe sets, and a feature so you can visualize it, cell file, so you know what it is. Make sure you understand what are the different types of data structure in R, which is list, vector, matrix, data frame, and environment, and how to access elements, how to delete elements, how to add elements. And your homework, I'm taking a little bit time to change some things there. Um, <clears throat> So it'll find it, you'll find it more useful by exercising uh, them. So I'm hoping to post it on Monday or Tuesday morning, which will be due in a week. But next week, we'll cover uh, T -statist test statistics and bioconductor. And we'll be getting into a rhythm where your next sex assignments, the first week I'll review and give you a prototype solution. And your next assignment will be due two weeks from that. So that's how we'll pretty much go the next uh, 10 weeks that we have left. Take some time for the first two weeks to catch up and whatnot. So I hope you find this session useful. It's 8.06 unless there isn't any question um, from the online or from the phone. You guys enjoy the weekend and hope to see you guys on Thursday and we'll communicate via email. Okay? Alright then. Take it easy.